Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us today for our Young Leaders United Fall Speaker Series session. Uh, just a quick note before we get started, uh, please ensure that you are in speaker view um, and you can do that by going to the upper right hand corner under view. Um, you may be in gal there's gallery and speakers. So if you just want to switch to speaker, that'd probably be the best experience. Uh, my name is Morley Patel, and I'm the Director of Civic and Partner Engagement here at United Way of Metro Chicago. If you're interested in learning more about um, Young Leaders United and how you can get involved, we will be going over those details at the end of the program, so please stay tuned. Uh, before getting to our speaker, CEO Kamau Murray, I'd like to take a moment and give you all a brief background on United Way and our work in communities. Great. So as you can see at United Way, we employ a dual approach to community impact. First, with that first circle, um, we help families in need by supporting over 120 nonprofit organizations throughout Metro Chicago who focus on basic needs services. Second, we rebuild neighborhoods to be stronger and more equitable through an initiative called the Neighborhood Network. Next slide, please. Perfect. So here are our 10 neighborhood networks located primarily in the South and West regions of Metro Chicago in predominantly Black and Latinx communities. These are all neighborhoods which have faced stark economic disinvestment. So the neighborhood network is a collaborative partnership model which creates coalitions of nonprofit and government institutions who work together with community and business leaders within a neighborhood to identify community priorities and find resident-driven solutions to challenges. Next slide, thank you. This place-based approach is led by a community quarterback, which is the lead nonprofit organization in each neighborhood network that helps bring to the table all of the people, resources, and ideas needed to execute on community plans. We have found that this inside out neighborhood led transformation is really the key to maintaining the history and culture of neighborhoods while accelerating a regional recovery strategy that builds equal opportunities and access to everyone, regardless of zip code. So that's a little background on United Way and our work in communities. And if you'd like to learn more about us and how you can get involved, please visit Live United chicago.org. Now to introduce today's speakers, please welcome Young Leaders United member Joe Jacobs. Thank you, Morley. Uh, similar to United Way, today's speaker Kamal Murray also follows a place-based approach to community impact with his XS Tennis and Education Foundation located on Chicago's South Side in Washington Park, an area of the city in need of this type of neighborhood investment. While working in the corporate sector, Murray began coaching kids to give back to the community. His passion for coaching led to the opening of X, X Step, one of the largest tennis centers in the country with the mission to provide Chicago's youth, underserved youth, sorry, with an enriching safe haven and a positive pathway to college through a community-based tennis and academic enrichment program. Since starting X Step, Murray left the corporate sector, sending more than 50 youth to division one schools with tennis scholarships, Coach Sloan Stevens to the U.S. Open title in 2017 and is a regular commentator on the Tennis Channel. Kamal will be interviewed by our Young Leaders United Executive Council member, Stephanie Severin, who serves as a Senior Associate Regional Director at the Anti-Defamation League. Now, please join me in welcoming Kamal and Stephanie. Thank you so much, Joe. I really appreciate that introduction. And Kamal, I am so excited to chat with you today that I would love for us to just dive right in and start the conversation. Um, I was especially struck by your amazingly diversified resume, your D1 athlete, uh, title winning coach, consultant, sales rep, um, community advocate, and of course, founder and CEO. Can you speak to us all today a little bit more about how you translated all of your training and experience to a mission-driven career for yourself and for your community? Um, so I, I don't know if I would say I intentionally translated it. I think, you know, just as you go through life and these processes, I would just say, you know, always being mentally present and engaged 
uh, and like looking for the lesson, um, you know, and how people treat you, the questions that they ask so that you know how to address them next time. Um, but I mean, I had, you know, growing up playing tennis, I was always the only African-American, you know, in the circle. Um, and I think in my early days, it, you know, made me, you know, sort of uncomfortable and very shy. I used to actually hide my tennis racket uh, in the garbage can at the court in the park at uh, Jesse Owens Park on 87th and Jeffrey, because I was ashamed to walk down the street where I grew up, 72nd and Paxton, uh, with the tennis racket, not knowing how the community would react and my friends would react. So um, I think the struggle early on was being a tennis player, not being accepted by your neighborhood, but then also not being accepted by the white kids in the country clubs, right? So it was like you grew this we're not accepted either one. And um, I was a middle child in a middle-class family. So I was able to sort of hide in the middle too. So I I developed a lot of, you know, spent a lot of time by myself, you know, to just, um, you know, learning myself. Um, and, you know, from there just developed this independence, right? And then, you know, which now today just lends to like an, an armor, I would say, um, uh, and pride in self. And then, you know, the benefit was having learned how to, you know, navigate or exist in that world. I remember my first junior tournament, I got asked to play uh, doubles with an Asian guy. His name was Philip Kim, I still remember. And we developed a friendship. And um, he called me one day and said, hey, I'm in your neighborhood. It's like, my neighborhood? Turns out his family owned the wig shop on the corner of my block on 71st and Paxton. <laughs> So it just show how like, you know, even in, in that setting, you can kind of find commonality. Um, but, you know, I think that experience made me feel comfortable working uh, in corporate America. So I got a full scholarship to college, went to an HBCU, uh, was part of the first all black team that goes to the NCAA tournament. And we got ranked as high as 24 in the country. Uh, and then, you know, was playing in summer pro-ams and country clubs with all, you know, ritzy, pritzy, rich folks. And one of the guys I played, um, you know, tennis with was a guy named Bill Steer, who was the CEO of Pfizer Pharmaceuticals. And, um, you know, he said, hey, when this tennis thing doesn't work out, then, you know, call me, I'll give you a job. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, well, you're good, but you're not that good. So when it doesn't work out, call me, I'll give you a job. So uh, I did several internships with Pfizer. And then after uh, graduate school, I went to work with Pfizer and had a very nice Pfizer apartment on 56 in between fifth and sixth. <laughs> That's really amazing. I love the idea of look for the lesson and thank you for being vulnerable enough to share, not always knowing where you fit in. And I think when we see leaders like you in the community, it can feel like, oh, this must've been obvious. This must've been thrust at their feet, but it's it's refreshing to hear that it might not have always been obvious, but you took all the pieces and, and took all those lessons and took a chance. So I really, really appreciate that insight. Um, you also mentioned being one of the only African-American tennis players that you knew. And in looking into some of the background for our chat today, I, I ran the numbers and was somewhat shocked, but shouldn't have been, that it's really just less than 60 years ago that country clubs, tennis associations barred Black players from membership, from competition. So we've been fortunate that there have been civil rights activists and tireless tennis enthusiasts like yourself who have pushed through and because of that, we've seen many notable black tennis players. They've gained titles and notoriety, Althea Gibson, Arthur Ashe, Venus and Serena, uh, Naomi Osaka, and obviously your protege, Sloan Stevens. Um, that said, many people still see tennis as a largely white sport. And I'd love to hear from you more about how you approach dismantling stereotypes around tennis, increasing access to the sport, um, how Access Tennis and Education Foundation act in that role, and if there's anything that we all can do to remove some of that stigma or that stereotype from tennis. Yeah, I think, um, you know, like you said, historically, Blacks were not allowed to join tennis clubs, uh, Blacks and Jewish people, as a matter of fact, and um, Jewish people were able to sort of create their own tennis club. So if you get a uh, Hillcrest Country Club in LA is a Jewish only club. Uh, in Toronto, there's two Jewish only clubs. One of them is named York Rackets, which is in Yorkville, uh, I think it is. So they were able to sort of, you know, financially come together and build their own tennis clubs. And um, African-Americans didn't have the wherewithal to do that. So they just, you know, learned to play in the park and created social clubs, uh, which only could occur in warm, you know, warm weather. So cities like Chicago, uh, there's a, a very historic black tennis club called Chicago Prairie Tennis Club, but it's active four months out of the year. And then after that, it sort of went dormant. Um, and then, you know, sort of starts to bubble up and then, you know, 
back when I was a kid, there was a facility on 47th Street and it was uh, owned by, it was actually a high park racquetball club. And that was like the black mecca of tennis in the country. So Arthur Ashe came there, Venus Serena, Zena Garrison. Uh, if you were black and you came through Chicago, even on a layover in O'Hare, you came there. Uh, and that is where I sort of got to meet a lot of sort of historic people in the sport um, and see like black professionals. It was a lot of doctors, lawyers, business people that, you know, lived around that 47th street area where the president now lives. Um, and, you know, that allowed me to sort of become mentored by them. You know, I was always, my parents had four kids. So one played basketball, one played volleyball, one swam and I played tennis. And so uh, it was always like rock, paper, scissors of who had to take the bus home. <laughs> right, because my, my mom had to pick up all four of us. And so I always end up losing and having to take the bus home. So I end up getting a ride from, you know, lots of good business people. And that little 12 minutes in the car from the facility to my house end up, be, you know, getting a lot of life lessons and mentorship. Um, and so, you know, it, it was when I got older, it was like, hey, maybe we should sort of try to recreate that. You know, the facility became something else. Um, it got taken over by another operator who um, made it and you know, raised the prices, made it into a traditional tennis experience, which uh, you know, shut the community out. And so my best friend growing up was a dude named Quentin Richardson. And um, he ended up getting drafted into the NBA and making like a hundred million bucks. So I had this bright idea to like buy out the operator. Um, you know, and we did that and then created sort of excess tennis and basically dropped the prices, made it nonprofit, created unprecedented access, put a basketball court in um, and sort of recreated the environment that we had grown up in. And then, you know, out of that, you know, the demand grew, right? You drop prices, right? Then demand grows. So the demand grew again to what it once was. And then that's where excess tennis came from. Uh, and then in 2012, the landlord was, you know, had another deal on the table, which was way more profitable than a tennis club. Uh, and so we were like, okay, well, we got to go now. So we tried to find a, a scenario we can have a permanent home, um, both indoor and outdoor, and sort of control our own destiny. Um, but, you know, I think the sport's got a long way to go. So you look at, I mean, it's miraculous if you look at the African-Americans in the sport, given the, the limited access that they had, um, that they actually made it. You know, Vince and Serena actually are from Saginaw, Michigan, which is a cold weather climate, mm -hmm. which, you know, if you learn to play in the summertime and then once the cold hits, you got to go indoors. So it, again, even at that time where Blacks were allowed to join tennis clubs, it still was super expensive. And so that's why you see what I like to call the great migration of tennis players moving to LA or Florida or Texas, not because they want to, just because if you want to play tennis, you know, at, at a, on a shoestring budget, it's got to be outdoors. So, um, you know, we see that. We see, you know, Coco Golf's dad, Corey, worked for Abbott Labs in Chicago. And then now they live in Florida. So you know, Madison Keys is from Quad Cities, which is 42 hours from Chicago. Then she moved to Florida. So you see, you know, sort of these players, you know, kind of grow up in urban settings and then, you know, for whatever reason, whether it's big tennis academies or financial reasons, move to places where they can play outdoors. Not because you got to live in Florida to get good, but it's just a court in every subdivision in Florida. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think I ever really thought about the fact that there were social barriers and then environmental barriers that the change in weather makes it that much harder to gain access to a court. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. it's, I mean, everything about tennis is sort of limiting, you know what I mean? Even when you think about um, the seasonal thing, right? So you think about how to grow this sport in three quarters of the year, the sport is played outside of the U.S. at times that aren't cooperative with U.S. TV, you know, so the Asia swing, which is typically right now, you know, Americans are asleep. Mm -hmm. Australian open, people are, you know, six weeks on the calendar where it's like in Australia and the Middle East and Americans are asleep, you know, so in terms of even viewership, um, it's very limited. So the chance for American kids, minority kids to fall in love with the sport, unless they're up at 3 a.m., you know, in October through February, they're not watching tennis. Yeah, so that local exposure is so, so key to just even growing a love for the sport. Yeah. Well, I think that ties in pretty well to my next question, which relates to your recent large event, the Chicago Women's Open. Congratulations on completing that. I'm sure that was no small feat. And uh, it was also the only black produced event on the whole WTA tour, which I find just 
almost unfathomable. It's 2021, but here we are. Mm -hmm. uh, what advice do you have for anyone out there thinking about being the first to establish something in their community or company, especially when that might push the people around them out of their comfort zone or really push against accepted norms? Um, uh, that's a good question. So I would say first, you know, you've got to be, you know, you got to really be able to handle it. You look at uh, a lot of athletes who step out there uh, for different causes right? Not knowing the reaction that they're going to get. And the reaction comes back, you know, maybe some good, some bad, and they're unable to handle the bad. And then they run back into their shell. Uh, they're not able to play tennis anymore, right? They need a break from tennis. So, you know, I would say before you embark on, you know, being a pioneer, just to make sure you're thick skinned enough to handle it. Um, and then, you know, also be committed because every day there's like, you know, stuff that happens, you know, whatever can go wrong, will go wrong. And, you know, the one thing I think that tennis taught me is never panic. Um, you know, so, you know, you see, you know, I think number one, Chicago breeds pretty tough people. So, you know, you see in times of stress, like we've had lot, lots of stressful moments the past month and even this week at the tournament. And I see, um, you know, how people react to it. And my first, I never used the word weak, but I was talking to one of my mentors who I won't name, who's a female. And she was like, yeah, you know, hold on a second. Uh, and it was saying that, you know, you know, some people are weak and can't handle sort of adversity, um, you know, in, in stressful situations. So, you know, you got to be strong when you think about handling that um, and then, you know, be committed because if you're not able to pivot or not willing to sort of be here at 3 a.m. and wash towels, you know, if the, you know, things still have to happen. So if the laundry guy doesn't show up to grab the player's clothes and grab the dirty towels, then you gotta be willing to take them home and wash them yourself, right? So I've washed 50 loads of towels in the past month just because, you know, vendors don't deliver, but it still has to happen. Um, or, you know, by countless situations, right? And so I would say, just be committed to it, you know, and be willing to sort of put in the work and defend it, you know what I mean? And I think, you know, the biggest lesson I would say that I've learned is like being, you know, probably the only person on the South side of Chicago trying to grow tennis and preach this tennis message is just to be clear in the message. And I think that, you know, a lot of the, early on, I started talking to people and I'm like, well, it's, it's so simple. It's this, this, and this, why don't you get it? Right. And I think for, you know, people who are naive to your cause, um, you know, it's not clear. And so I've learned over the years to just be really clear and concise in my message. Um, you know, so that people can get behind it. You know, people don't get behind things they don't understand. And so, you know, bright ideas in an organization or in a company, um, you know, are often, you know, not their idea and maybe not understand the depth of what you're trying to say. So I would say be really clear in your message. Yeah, and I mean, being the first, it's not gonna happen overnight. I'm sure it's a much longer runway. And to your point and to your dedication, you have to do more pieces of the puzzle than just, throw the idea out there. You're, you're washing towels and you're coaching the kids and you're making the schedules and making the calls. So you really have to take on the full slate of activities if you're gonna, if you're gonna embark on these kinds of endeavors. Um, so that can be intimidating, but I think it's important to be honest and keep that in mind. Um, Stand, standing on the bus stop in like five degrees, taking two, two trains and a bus to school makes you tough in Chicago. <laughs> Yes, make it through that winter every year. I feel like you come out the other yeah. side a little stronger each yeah. time. Um, I also like the thought of making sure that your message is clear, not just to yourself, but to others. I mean, to you, it must be so obvious that tennis is such a strong tool for building resilience and building community, but there are plenty of people out there who that might not be so obvious for. Do you have any tips for building that kind of message when something is so innate and obvious to you? Do you have people who you gut check with or do you practice in front of a mirror? Do you have any kind of tips or tricks on that? Um, no, I don't really have. I, I think one of my, you know, I'm not the smartest dude, but one of my gifts is being able to like articulate you know, an idea. Um, but I do have like mentors, not that I go to for gut check, but for support, because, you know, there are a lot of times where I'm like, you know what, I don't need this. I can just go back to work. You know what I mean? Or um, I could be doing other things. And like, I call on this woman named Zena Garrison or Billie Jean King, when I like get ready to just say, you know what, I don't have to do this. I can do other things. I'm okay. I can do this. I can do that. 
I feel like I'm the only one fighting. And then they kind of like put me back in my place and say, don't be such a wimp. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, you know, I think I have people that I lean on when it gets tough and I get really annoyed and impatient um, with the lack of commitment or people willingness to sort of support. Um, but, you know, other than that, I think, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily need to practice in the mirror. Um, but I do I oftentimes enjoy a drive, you know what I mean? Like late at night, I will, you know, after I put my kids to sleep and, you know, maybe me and my wife are not like, you know, seeing eye to eye, I'll get up and go for a drive. And then I do sort of do my little voice notes. Um, and that has helped. I love that. I love that. It's all practice. It's all practice. That's what you're bringing it back to for us, that you've got yeah. to practice all these things and then all the pieces will fall into place. Okay, you you dropped some very impressive names there. So I do want to talk a little bit about your Rolodex. You uh, have a lot of great friends and business partners and investors in your mission. And um, for a lot of us here today, I'm sure we're curious how we can keep authentically and meaningfully building our Rolodexes. And I know you mentioned when you only have 12 minutes in the car, that might be a good time to take advantage of, of the conversation and the lessons that you might be able to learn. So what steps do you suggest for individuals looking to expand their network and find like-minded individuals, or maybe not so like-minded individuals uh, to support their efforts, their endeavors, their, their mission-driven goals in life? I think I'm actually bad at it, right? I'm like really bad at asking, um, um, but I'm really good at like, I think building relationships. Like I have like depth of relationships now that maybe started out as an ask, right? Or as a um, you know, soliciting for donations. And then you get so close to people that it becomes very uncomfortable to ask them for support or for money. Um, so I would say, you know, number one, closed mouth doesn't get fed. And so if you want to network, you got to like sort of reach out and be proactive. Um, you know, don't expect them to reach out to you, but then also build a relationship, you know, to where it's just beyond you asking for something, you know what I mean? Always mm -hmm. reaching out when you ask, so just be consistent in that. Even if you see something silly on Twitter or whatever, that they, you just send them this, right? And then, you know, don't be like me. Like, don't be afraid to ask. You know, now at, at this point, I am, that is one of my biggest downfalls that I'm like extremely close to people who may have donated large sums of money initially. And now we've become almost like family. Mm -hmm. I, I had a donor come to the tennis tournament. Um, large donor and they were like oh why isn't our name up there and I'm like well you didn't ask us for money you know that kind of thing right so like looks bad you know what I mean it was yeah, like yeah. oh well, we're so close I'm like well like family now I felt uncomfortable asking you know what I mean it's like we go to dinner twice twice a month you should ask right um and so don't be that bro. don't be that guy because I'm that guy um that you know I, if they don't offer I don't ask and that's to be in the philanthropic space that's a bad trait um to have because then they feel left out like I'm thinking like I don't want to bother you and beg you know but then they like they want to be in everybody else is and they want to be in um so don't be like me ask I feel like there are some very great qualities that you bring to the table but I hear you I mean having worked in nonprofit space they say the worst thing you can do is not ask and the worst thing someone can say is no and I think especially to your point if you've built that relationship with them um, it won't be coming out of nowhere and you might actually be doing more harm by not including them in the conversation and seeing what they think they might be able to do um, to, sh to show support. So I think those are all very important points and we won't be like you, but we'll try to be a little bit like you. <laughs> um, I want to bring it all back to United Way for a second. As we saw, they have an amazing place-based strategy that includes supporting nonprofit organizations who are creating new brick and mortar structures like your own in their neighborhoods. And the Access Tennis and Education Foundation spans nearly three city blocks in Chicago South Side. I'd love to hear more about how bringing this large, one of the largest tennis centers in the country to the neighborhood um, that was historically underserved when it came to athletics, especially tennis. How have you seen that impact the residents, the neighborhood? Um, have you seen you know, some new some new people coming through. I know you have. I would just love to hear more about that and the overall impact of that brick and mortar structure. Um, so I think that um, one of the unique things about this opportunity is that it's like people and place. You know, a lot of times we see, you know, cities like Chicago, we like, you know, create big buildings, we build buildings and it's like place. Um, but this is like people and place. Uh, and so, you know, I think that the neighborhood initially, you know, so, so 
public housing was supposed to be rebuilt here. And so uh, when we first you know, started having a conversation about this and there started to be city conversation about this, there was a lot of resistance actually to the public housing advocates about using this land for non-housing use. Um, I actually was in the background initially as well. You know, the city was like, let us, you know, let us take care of it. We'll go through the process, that kind of thing. And then um, at the time, the public housing advocates were, were thinking that they heard the word tennis, right? And, you know, 13 acres. And they thought it was like a some rich white dude coming to the neighborhoods, like build a, you know, ritzy pretty tennis club and take the poor people's land. And so, you know, after about a year, I sort of had to come out of the shadows and like, yeah, I'm the poor black dude, not the rich white dude uh, who's trying to build a tennis club. And so I thought that um, that was like a big aha for the neighborhood. Uh, and then just convince them that, you know, this was something that was being put in the fourth poor zip code for a reason, which proximity. So, you know, financial barrier is one thing, but also proximity to tennis is another sort of barrier. And so we're putting this in this zip code so that kids can walk or take a bus to the facility. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of distrust, you know, sometimes when you're doing work in these neighborhoods and projects are meant to do one thing and they end up doing a different thing. And so there's not a lot of trust in, you know, uh, black neighborhoods for new projects, right? You see the struggle with the Obama library where like mm -hmm. fighting over community benefits agreement and stuff like that. And so, you know, I had to build trust. My dad actually grew up, you know, in this area, went to high school across the street. So I had like a little bit of street cred, um, um, but it was it was hard. And so I think that now people drive by um, like, wow, that's I grew up there and that land used to be called the hole and blah, blah, blah. So now they see this tennis facility and they're like, oh, this is this is pretty cool. Uh, and now having, you know, 21 days of globally televised tennis tournaments uh, on a land that used to be the Robert Taylor homes is also like a, a feather in the cap. Um, but I do think also it's, it's attracting other investment. So now we're, you know, in the process of trying to build some housing neighboring to this or some black owned restaurants. I mean, right now we've probably got 2,500 people outside watching tennis right now. And it would be great to have a black owned sandwich shop or coffee shop uh, for them to walk to and patronize. And so, um, you know, there, there's, a, there's a whole, a whole sort of series of ancillary benefits that can be used off this facility to, you know, create this and use this as a node and re, recreate Washington Park and fill in some of the vacant lots and repurpose some of the buildings. Uh, so I think we're slowly getting there. Um, you know, Chicago is a big city and it's hard to move. Um, and so we're, we're, we're slowly getting the support we need to sort of, you know, continue to do phase one and phase two. But the other thing is that because the program has become sort of like nationally recognized, we're getting a lot of people from outside the immediate neighborhood to come participate in the program. So kids mm -hmm. from the north side, kids from the suburbs. We had five families move here to Chicago in the past year to like learn to play here. So, um, you know, I think it's, it's having a good effect uh, on the neighborhood as well. And I mean, that's another thing you bring dollars from outside the community to the community, right? So if there was a a minority owned, you know, ice cream shop, sandwich shop, coffee shop. Now, you not only get the dollars to circulate within the community, but you get dollars brought to the neighborhood from outside the community. So, um, you know, we've got to sort of speed up the process. Let me just say this, because there's a lot of good things happening. And, um, you know, we've got to start to surround this with the, with the things it needs um, for it to survive. Yeah, yeah, I think, you raised some really important points about people and place. You can't just build the structure. You have to have the people in it and highlighting the importance of trust within that process um, can't be lost. You know, there, there are people who are gonna be hesitant to your efforts, even if you are trying to quote unquote help. And so to not let that deter you, but to really find ways to get through to people. I think you've emphasized the long-term benefits, but it could be a long-term investment that you have to make to really get through to people in the community. So I really appreciate that. I appreciate all these lessons you're bringing to the table. I don't want to hog the conversation. I would love to open it up to Q&A from our audience members who are here today. Um, for anyone out there who has a question, please feel free to throw it in the chat, either via a direct message to me, um, or if you're, if you're bold and brave in a message to everyone here today. Um, and yeah, let, let's let's have a conversation. So I do have a question here. 
um, from Joe. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, Kamal, what ultimately inspired you to enter the nonprofit space? What advice do you have for others in the corporate sector who may be looking to pursue uh, mission-driven community work? So it's funny. So when I started um, Excess Tennis back in 2005, I started it as a for-profit. It was Excess Tennis Inc. And then we moved into our own facility in 2008. And then during that year, so we now we had a roof, right? So now we had light bill, water bill, rent to pay, right? We had 180 grand in, in sort of rent to pay plus so probably about 300 grand in overhead. Um, and we would get people coming in paying with like quarters and change, right? And at the rates we were charging, you know, you look at the PL at the end of the year and it was like break even, right? Plus the 9% amusement tax, right? So every tennis court rental comes with a 9% amusement tax, right? So when you look at a break-even model, because we charge so little, you look at people coming in with bags of change to pay for tennis lessons. And then you look at the 9% amusement tax as a for-profit organization. At the end of that year, all of my time in college was like, eh, this feels like it should be not-for-profit. And so it was then when we said, you know what, this should be not-for-profit. And at the time I was still working a full-time job. I still worked for Pfizer at that time and I wasn't collecting a salary anyway. So it wasn't like it was paying my bills. It was probably costing me more money uh, than it was making me. And so I decided that, you know, this based on just the sheer experience in that first year that this should is a better model for a not-for-profit model, right? And if we were gonna sustain, we would need other partners. Um, so that's how I became not-for-profit. It was originally gonna be like, hey, you know what? Let's see if we can make this tennis thing into a business. And then doing it in that neighborhood, it was like, yeah, maybe not. You know, <laughs> you got to give people free lessons, right? We were giving people free lessons, even though it wasn't a structured non for profit at the time. Um, we would, you know, people say, hey, I can't afford, you know, $15 for the class. I can afford $10. And we're like, all right, come on in, right? You know, so that after that year was like, all right, you know, this feels like a non for profit. So that's how. I got into the nonprofit space. It was totally unintentional. It was just based on what the PNL said. <laughs> that is amazing. It sounds like throughout your career, from your own personal resume to building excess tenants, it was really about, again, you said looking for the lessons, remaining, you know, flexible and fluid to the information that was coming in and then making decisions based on that and not necessarily being too stubborn about this is going to be a business or this is going to be a nonprofit, but kind of letting the answers come to you. Um, I think that can be difficult. I think it can yeah. be really difficult to admit, okay, maybe we need to pivot here or make a, or make a small change to make this successful. Yeah, but there's, you know, I, I thought it would survive. I thought it would be a for-profit because there's other clubs in the city that are like making tons of money and expanding and got 4,000 members and are charging premium court rates. You got five seasons in Burr Ridge and Hinsdale Rack Club and Midtown. So I was like, okay, this has to be a business, right? And then in that neighborhood, it just wasn't. Mm -hmm. right? It wasn't enough stay-at-home moms or people who were um, entrepreneurs to play during the day, right? Um, yeah. And so we really were only busy from 4 to 9 p.m. And so that's what made it seem like, okay, well, you know, that's how those others are surviving because they're in Lincoln Park and they have a lot of stay-at-home moms or people who are entrepreneurs or on their own business or just have flexible work schedules. Uh, and in my neighborhood, it was the working class. And so people were at work until 4 o'clock and the kids were in school until 4 o'clock. And so we really had a four to nine business. Mm. So that's what sort of made it clear that it should be, you know, a not-for-profit. Yeah, that makes sense to keep it affordable to the community. And since that's your primary base, that MPO status was what was going to keep your doors open. Yeah. Um, on a similar note, I have a question here from Stev. Um, what are other ways that people here today can get involved with community impact work without changing their career paths? And I guess to say it another way, how do you depend on individuals who might work in the corporate sector to help keep excess tennis going and open day to day? So those are two different questions. It said people who are in corporate who wanna get into nonprofit. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would say, you know, join boards. Um, you know, I didn't dive in, like self-admittedly, I, I started excess in 2005. We got our own roof in 2008. And I was working a full-time job until January 27th of 2015. So I was working during the day. I mean, I didn't trust it, right? I was like, you know, the golden handcuffs. It was like, I had a free car, free gas, free cell phone, you know, free printer, free computer. Um, and so I didn't really, you know, I was sort of like went into it really slow. Um, I didn't just jump in and say, hey, I think I wanna be, you know, social entrepreneur. 
um, I just sort of took it really slow. And I was really kind of forced into, you know, leaving my job. It was, I was in Australia with a player named Taylor Townsend. And, you know, you go to Australia January 1st, and then there's like two or three lead up tournaments. And then Australian Open starts last week in January. And I had used up 26 of my vacation days in the first month of the year. And she was going to play Caroline Wozniacki, who was number one seed. Serena was like injured at the time. So Caroline snuck into the world number one spot. So Taylor was going to play her first round, uh, which means you're playing number one player in the world, you're going to be on ESPN, right? And in my line of work, you know, pharmaceutical reps, you sit in doctor's offices all day and watch TV. So I'm like, okay. So I used up all my vacation days, all my six days, all my sick days in the first 26 days of the year. One of my coworkers is going to see me as they sit in a doctor's office watching TV. So I called my boss and was like, yeah, you know, I'm going to have to resign. The tennis thing is going to work out, blah, 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 blah. And he was like, you don't have to quit. I'll cover it for you. It's all good. You know? <laughs> um, and so, you know, but I still quit there. So it was, you know, I was really cautious as to going into it, but, you know, to work in corporate America and use your company to help, you know, your mission. So if you are, want to be in love theater or love dance or love tennis or love sport, you know, stay at Bank of America, right? Stay at PNC or whatever, and then bring them into your mission. Um, so that would be my advice. Um, you know, it's, especially if you're serving kids, if you're serving youth, a lot of that's happening after five. And so mm -hmm. there might not be a necessity to leave your day job initially because the people you want to serve are in school. Um, and so I would, I would say work as long as you can uh, and continue to try to like maybe be the bridge between your organization and your mission. I love that. And I could not agree more. Um, having been in the nonprofit sector for a while, I have a lot of people ask, how do I join the nonprofit sector? I'm going to leave my corporate job and help you. And I said, you can help me by staying at your corporate job <laughs> and getting the, using those days off to volunteer or getting that corporate sponsorship for the organizations that you care about. And so, yes, there's definitely space in the nonprofit sector for everyone, um, but we need that balance. We, we have to work together in that ecosystem. So I definitely agree with that uh, wholeheartedly. Um, tied into, you know, making that jump from nonprofit uh, or from corporate to nonprofit, I know you were a little bit uh, forced in your hand by the sick days and va vacation days running out, but how did you overcome that fear? Um, I feel, I feel empathetic to that golden handcuffs of having that salary, having that predictability. Do you have any tips? Maybe it comes from the athletic side, the tournament side, but for people who are looking to just make that leap, whether it's to the nonprofit sector or into some big project. Uh, that they want to start? Um, so at the time, we were also, in addition to coaching, you know, a professional tennis player that was on her way to making it, um, we had also raised the money to build the building, right? And so when you raise $16 million, they're like, okay, you need to be all in now. We know you're working. It's great. But now you need to be all in. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, working a full-time job was kind of a challenge when I was raising money. Uh, in this neighborhood, because obviously in a city like Chicago, where all the tennis clubs were located north, where all the wealth is, right, and all the wealth that belonged to those tennis club owners, I would go have, you know, fundraising meetings, and they, you know, with people who belong to other clubs, and um, then they'd go to that club owner, and, hey, you ever heard of a dude named Kamal Murray? They're like, yeah, he's, but he's not committed to the sport anyway, he still works a job, you know, so me actually working a job was sort of a hindrance, because it made it seem like I was not all in when all I was trying to do is just like just be prudent right in my decision making yeah. um so I think you know obviously when you start coaching at, you know pro tennis and you're like on tv and now you're like really entrenched in it it gives you a different level of confidence to like sort of leave your job mm -hmm. and then um I look at it like I had the nonprofit thing but I was leaving one corporate job for a coaching job right so like I, I viewed my pro coaching job as like my corporate job, right? Where I could collect the salary, not from my nonprofit, but from a player. And so that's so I'm just, just lucky to be able to be in tennis, get money from a player, and then still sort of have it be so tied to my mission of teaching other, other kids to play tennis, right? And trying to grow an academy. I mean, the best way to grow an academy is to have like superstar tennis players on TV, right? Because <laughs> then every kid wants to come in. So it was just a really unique situation where I was able to leave corporate and then work for an athlete who was starting to make money. Um, yeah. So that's how it happened. 
I mean, so that's balancing a lot. That is making a lot of very, you know, decisions based on chance. You had a lot of information, you had a lot of success to, to look back on, but a lot of it was just based on your gut and based on, on taking a risk. And we have a great question that I think ties into this. Do you have one story or a moment in coaching um, or on the court, maybe with a young player where you knew you were really making a difference and this is what you had to do day in and day out? Is there a pivotal moment that you can look back on? Um. Hmm, that's a good question. Um, so I would say when I first started coaching a player named Sloan Stevens, in our very first tournament together, she won her title. So she, so Sloan at the time was the only American or the only player, female player, to be top 25 and never won a tournament. Um, and so she won a tournament in 2015 in like that summer. And then our very first tournament together, she won another tournament. Right. And so I don't know if it's a honeymoon period or whatever it was, you know, um, but at that point, then I was like, OK, now I'm going to make it right. Because prior to that, it was like, OK, yeah, I'm coaching a young up and coming player, um, still trying to like sort of get people to believe that I knew what I was doing because I didn't play pro tennis. Um, but then when Sloan won her first tournament with me, then it was like, all right, now I'm in the club. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, so I would say that that tournament in Auckland it was Auckland 2016. Um, that term in Auckland sort of, I think, you know, really got me, I don't want to say cemented, but, you know, it's like wet cement, right, <laughs> um, into the tennis world as somebody who belonged and was worthy and into the club. Uh, and then she won a tournament the next two months. That The next month she won a tournament in Acapulco, and then the next month she won a tournament in Charleston. So it was like three tournaments in four months. Um, and so then I was like, all right, now I'm solidly in, right? Um, and then she got injured. And then you know that happened. Come on. Uh, she's not here yet. So yeah, that was that was the story I would say where it was sort of pivotal. You felt it was all coming together. I have a yeah. friend who says that she worked hard to be this lucky, and it seems like you really built the strong foundation so that you called it a honeymoon period, but you had put in a lot of the work to make sure that that successful moment could at some point come to fruition. So. Um, we look to the past. There's a question here uh, asking about the future. Um, what is your long-term vision for XS Tennis? Do you see yourself expanding nationally if given the chance? Mm, that's a good question. So long-term vision is really to continue to use this as a node to develop the area. I mean, there's nine acres of vacant land north of me. There's 65,000 square feet of vacant land to the east of me. Um, and you know, now we're trying to build affordable housing and a hotel. Mm -hmm. Um, and another, you know, sports facility for denser sports, right? So like, you know, we were trying to get like, you know, restaurants to come over here. They say, well, A, there's not enough rooftops and B, there are two people on one tennis court that's 8,000 square feet. So you don't even have enough density, although it's great, it's just not a lot of density. So we were trying to build, or we are trying to build a 100,000 square foot indoor basketball and soccer facility, which basketball and soccer are very dense sports and that will help make the case for having a sandwich shop right um, in addition new housing would have a make the case for eateries etc so that's sort of what I'm focused on now is just trying to build out the neighborhood around the facility um, because I don't think that in five years if we're still sort of on an island that we'll be as successful um, mm -hmm. and then in, in terms of the question about going nationally not really I mean you know coaching tennis and dealing with Tennis parents is rough. And so, um, you know, I don't really have an emotional connection to, let's say, Colorado, right? And, you know, to sort of do this at this level and to have parents calling your phone at 11 o'clock at night, you got to be like emotionally tied to like the mission. Um, and so I haven't thought about like the whole, I've thought about it, but I'm not super excited about like the franchise model of mm -hmm. growing. Um, I've sent like our capital stack to several other organizations, like in North Carolina and New Orleans, like, hey, here's our capital stack, here's how we did it, good luck. Um, but, you know, I don't really aspire to be managing something like that from afar. Yeah. But open to sharing, like open to go down there and speak and, you know, help people sort of, you know, proof of concept kind of thing and even yeah. provide some guidance. Um, Cause I do want to see the sport grow, but, you know, 
I got enough parents in Chicago calling me. I don't need any parents in any other state calling me. Well, you know, there were too many kids on the court in my class. And that teacher, like, you know, yelled at my kid. Like, yeah, you know. <laughs> so you'll stick to the mentorship track, not the franchising track when it yeah, comes to yeah. branding. And I do think it's, um, you know, tennis court, tennis coaching is a thankless job. And so you look at the girl who just won the U.S. Open out of nowhere and fired her coach. You know, the only way you coach kids or coach this sport and deal with all that comes with it is if you are invested in it. And mm -hmm. so I think that that should come from local folks. Yeah. Because at every level, it's underappreciated. You know, the kid, you know, the player did it on their own. You had no part of it, right? Um, and so, like, you know, just the, the girl who fired her coach after winning a Grand Slam out of nowhere is an example of, like, you know, you wouldn't have done that without him, right? Mm -hmm. So. You know, I've experienced that. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take it from a Chicago parent, but you know, <laughs> no emotional connection to other place in the country. But I think that also ties to, you know, starting with the community you're in and really investing in the community you're in. And you've spoken about, you know, building out the area around excess tennis and, you know, your being um, from the community, having ties to the community, I think helps balance some of that fear of gentrification with some one who's invested in keeping the neighborhood um, intact and strong. Um, so that I, I think is so important. And to the extent that that is a thankless job and coaching is a thankless job, you have just piled thankless jobs onto your plate for which we <laughs> will today say thank you um, because it is so important. We're running out of time and I know there are a lot of great questions. I would really love to um, feature some of these questions that are looking at how attendees today can help you. Um, so there are some full-time corporate employees who want to know how they can get their companies involved, um, but also individuals wondering how they can volunteer, how they can sign up to take lessons um, or sign their children up to be a part of the excess tennis community. Yeah, so we've got, I mean, like right now, if you turn on Tennis Channel right now, uh, our tournament is live on Tennis Channel as we speak. So we've got lots of corporate partners um, locally here in Chicago. Uh, one of the unique opportunities of excess is that it is deeply rooted in the community, but also provides some global exposure. Like the tournament that's going on right now is globally televised um, and the athletes come from all across the globe. So corporations with a, with a global presence, this is like a good way to do good, but also, you know, get your brand recognized. Um, so, you know, if, if people are willing to dig in, you know, what I think, what I like about tennis is um, in order to get good at this sport, you have to be committed to it at a minimum of 10 hours a week. So the kids in our program are here 10 hours a week. And when you think about what that does to reduce um, their chances of being either engaged in violence or becoming a victim in violence, right? Mm -hmm. Because you know where these kids are. This isn't like, oh, they do something one day a week and then, you know, cross our fingers, nothing happens to them. That They are like here every day, all day. Uh, and then the one-on-one -on -one nature of this sport, right? So people who come take tennis lessons, there's so much one-on-one. -on -one. And the relationships are deep relationships, which I think ultimately helps them go further. Um, so, you know, they can obviously reach out to us, you know, email me, kmurray at xstennis.org. Um, secondly, in terms of volunteer, we have people who volunteer uh, hitting with players, like volunteer hitting partners, like a lot of former college guys who just want to get back in shape. They meant that we assign them to a kid and they can become a hitting partner for a kid. Um, we also provide free tutoring to the community, even kids outside of the tennis program, um, Monday through Thursday from four to seven, so you can be a tutor. Um, we, do, we do visits to companies where we will take a van load of kids who are like juniors and seniors and do a day uh, on the trading floor or at the company um, to explore, you know, whether or not, like my first internship was an auditing internship and I was convinced in undergrad that I wanted to be an auditor. And I did three months as an auditor and they locked me in the back room with all these cancel checks and turned the heat up on like 95 to make my life really uncomfortable. And I was like, eh, I don't wanna be an auditor, right? So, so I think like those experiences are also there to partner with corporations. Um, and then, you know, there's obviously, you know, board positions, et cetera, that can be had as well. So we, we, we definitely are in need of, you know, more partners. Uh, in more creative ways. Um, we do have a couple interesting programs where we have scholarship programs. So uh, back in the day, the Czech Republic had a very interesting model where they took 
like 20 girls who were all born six months apart. And they basically funded their tenants from five years old uh, until they were like 17. And one year, three of the four Wimbledon semifinalists were from the Czech Republic, from that same sort of like test group. Petra Kvitova is one of them. She won Wimbledon twice. And so we have like uh, cohorts like that where we've got kids who we found in CPS schools who are all born six months apart. We bring them to the facility. We make it tutoring mandatory, six hours a week of tutoring. And then we give it eight hours on court. And the goal is just to see if we can sort of do the same thing. Like, can we create a cohort of kids uh, who all end up going to college? And so we have like Northern Trust sponsors a cohort, IMC Capital Market sponsors a cohort. So, and the cohort is like a hundred grand a year for 15 kids. and we get access to the academic records. We have net parents' name, phone number, social security number, birth date, single parent home, war they live in. We have all their information and we literally study them and provide tons of metrics around their progress. Um, so we're in need of more companies who are interested in doing more cohorts. Um, so, I mean, we've sent 55 kids to college with scholarships now and our goal is to send 555. So the more cohorts we can create, the closer we get to that goal. All right, let's do it. I know there are some people on this call who could make that happen. And I know, given your passion, I would love to see us help you expand your reach and help even more students find their love of tennis. I'm so glad you have opportunities for the non-athletes, speaking for myself, but it sounds like there are a lot of ways that we could all get involved. And I know I'll be taking you up on your offer to email you. Um, well, here's the thing too. If you think about like the non-athlete, right? When you think about, you know, American, um, we're dominated by baseball, football, basketball. And historically, the kid that plays tennis is the kid that was rejected by this sport, right? So I always make the joke. Um, you didn't make the baseball team, basketball team, football team, so your rich daddy bought you some tennis lessons, right? <laughs> and, you know, that's, that's the truth, right? Which is why we get sort of like the worst athletes in this game. Um, but the other thing is it, it shows that to become world-class in this or get a college scholarship, you don't have to be a great athlete. You just need to be committed, mm. right? And if you discipline yourself to show up 10 hours a week, get the lessons, get the training, you can sort of find your way in this sport, whether, you know, it, definitely to a college scholarship. And so um, I like that because I do consider this to be an opportunity for all kids. If you're not gifted enough, like my brother's 6'9", I'm 6'2", right? So I didn't get the gift of the genes, right? The 6'9 gene. So if you're not someone who is a gifted athlete, you can still you know, control your own destiny in this individual sport just by your, through your sheer commitment. And so that's why I think that when you think about kids who, um, you know, want to make something themselves, if they commit, you know, an organization, there's, there's not like a limiting factor. Oh my God, if they don't get six, six, they're never going to get, you know, cut. No, if they're just five, five and committed, right. And consistent, then they can sort of make something. So from a return on investment standpoint, from a corporation thing, you know, there are more factors in our control than out of our control. That is amazing. And despite everything we've heard about tennis being limited to a certain type of person, it sounds like it is really a sport for everyone and that everyone can enjoy. And you're making that so much easier in Chicago. And for that, I'm eternally grateful. We're coming up on time here and I want to be respectful of uh, everyone's uh, limited availability in their busy, busy lives. But Kamal, thank you. You are a very busy person for giving us an entire hour of your day, your wisdom. We're going to look for the lessons. We're going to not be like you, but be like you and ask people for what we need so that we can make great things happen in our community. Um, we truly, truly appreciate you being here. And um, I'll definitely be taking a lot of what you said to heart and motivating me through the, the last half of this year and hopefully for years to come. So thank you so, so much for being here. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Jen Barra, who is the uh, Young Leaders United Executive Council Chair uh, for just a few closing comments on what you can do to stay involved with United Way. But I hope, hope you'll also all stay involved with Kamal and Access Tennis. Thank you so much, Kamal. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Stephanie and, and Kamau. Again, I mean, Kamau, your dedication to the sport and to the neighborhood in Chicago. Um, it, I mean, we can just feel it coming through in this conversation. So thank you again. Uh, you know, as a city, we're lucky to have you um, as a member of the community. So that was fantastic. Um, again, not going to spend a lot of time here uh, because I know we're over time. 
I think that this is being recorded and, and you can see the deck, but here's just a brief overview of our Young Leaders United, which is a, an auxiliary board of United Way of Metro Chicago. Um, you can see our goals here engage within the Chicago community, um, delivering our time and resources to those in need and also ignite personal and professional growth. I think after this conversation, maybe we should get all YLU members together, really focus on our tennis skills so we can then help with uh, the hitting practice with the kids. Um, not sure we're gonna be able to, to come through maybe the next couple of months, but maybe by next year, we can uh, at least return some of the serves. <laughs> Um, with that, uh, a little bit of information on the next slide. If you do want to contact um, anyone about getting involved with United Way of um, Metro Chicago's YLU organization, uh, you can see up on the screen is my email as, as well as Stev. Um, Stev is the chair of our membership engagement committee. Committee, pardon me. Um, so he's fantastic um, at, at kind of getting you up to speed on some things that we're doing and uh, finding great ways to get involved. Um, and then lastly, here are a few upcoming United Way events, a couple great uh, opportunities coming up in October. So Women United, which is another auxiliary board of, of United Way of Metro Chicago, is also hosting a speaker series um, on October 20th. So um, that's a all state and United Way domestic violence panel. And then a couple of other opportunities coming up, including United for the Holidays, which is an annual event which United Way is involved with. Great things coming in 2022 as well. A couple of um, cohort opportunities for you to grow and develop. And what's not listed on here, but will be coming is uh, YLU's annual um, Ignite event. So uh, stay tuned. It'll be a, a fantastic event again this year. And just to wrap it up again, thank you so much Kamal for, for your time today and for everything you're doing in the community. And thank you all for joining in today. We'll see you at the next event. Thank you.